What are banded iron formations and what have they got to do with red beds? Now, one of the most iconic features of Archean and Proterozoic rocks is the presence of banded iron formations, or BIFs for short. So these BIFs are alternating bands of iron-rich and silica-rich minerals. Now, according to the conventional model, BIFs formed in an initially anoxic deep water environment that gradually became oxygenated. You see, according to the conventional model, early Earth's atmosphere contained no oxygen. And as we all know, iron, when placed in the presence of oxygen, it begins to change chemically. So where did this ferrous, as well as other types of free iron, where did it come from? Well, conventional theory, it contends that primitive forms of plate tectonics produced submarine volcanoes that pumped out loads of free iron, as well as many other elements like silica. Now, another source of iron and silica would come from exposed land. Since there was no oxygen in the atmosphere, then iron liberated from various types of igneous rocks through erosion, it would not be oxidized, and so would simply dissolve into the water when it rained. And of course, this water, which was rich with ferrous iron, would make its way to the oceans, where it, along with all the other free iron released from hydrothermal vents, would spend eons of time dissolved in the oceans. Well, what happened? Well, we've already talked about stromatolites. Now, if you missed that video, then the link is in the description. Please make sure you go back and watch it to sort of understand what we're talking about here. So essentially, in the process of photosynthesis, the stromatolite forming cyanobacteria created oodles and oodles of oxygen as part of their metabolic waste, which dissolved into the seawater. So about 3.5 billion years ago, again, according to the conventional timeline, this dissolved oceanic oxygen, it started to sort of chemically react with the dissolved free iron, and it precipitated out of the water column as magnetite, hematite, and siderite, as well as a whole host of other iron oxide minerals. Now, these now solid minerals, okay, they fell out of the ocean column to the ocean floor and accumulated in layers that alternated with silica-rich layers called chert. So it is hypothesized that the chert layers, they alternate with the iron-rich layers because the water column was episodically depleted of iron, leaving more of the silica, which was in greater abundance. And that is what was oxidized and fell to the ocean floor when there was no iron around. Now, keep in mind, however, that during the Archean, no oxygen had yet made its way into the atmosphere and could only be found in the oceans. Now, according to most scientists, Earth's global distribution of stromatolites and their photosynthetic metabolic pathways eventually caused oxygen to make its way into the atmosphere, culminating in what has been called the Great Oxidation Event, conventionally dated to 2.3 billion years ago. Now, BIFs mostly disappear from the rock record at about 1.8 billion years ago, as the theory goes, because by that time, atmospheric oxygen had so saturated Earth's oceans that free iron could no longer remain dissolved in the water column. And in fact, today, the Earth's oceans are completely depleted in all forms of free iron. Now, significantly, banded iron formations can be found on nearly all the Earth's continents, with some BIF sedimentary basins covering areas in excess of 50 thousand square kilometers and some formations attaining a thickness of 600 meters or for my american friends out there that's 1800 feet thick that is a lot of iron and it's for this reason that banded iron formations are also very important in the mining industry with more than 60 percent of earth's iron ore reserves existing in its banded iron form now if you're in an undergraduate class in historical geology 
you'll also come across another geologic feature associated with Biff's called red beds. Now, red beds are sedimentary layers of sandstone, siltstone, or shale that get their distinctive red color from the presence of iron oxides, such as hematite. Now, what's interesting about these sort of rusty colored sedimentary layers is that they do not occur in rocks older than about 2.3 billion years ago, again, using the conventional time scale. So before that time, sandstones, siltstones, and shales were much lighter in color due to the general absence of solid iron oxides. Now, this observation has caused a number of scientists to propose a link between the red beds and the biffs. Now, according to the secular model, atmospheric oxygen peaked to about 10% of today's level during the Great Oxidation event about 2.3 billion years ago. Now, at this level, atmospheric oxygen began to interact with non-oxidized and unstable minerals like pyrite and chemically alter them into iron oxides such as hematite. And it is the hematite, again, remember, that gives these sedimentary sandstones, siltstones, and shales their red color. So before about 2.3 billion years ago, we don't find much hematite in sedimentary rocks, although we do find a lot of non-oxidized pyrite. So the presence of oxygen is certainly a good reason for this contrast in the rock record. Now, of course, things don't line up perfectly. Remember, banded iron formations, they persist until about 1.8 billion years ago. Uh, but the thinking is that oxygen was rising at such a rate from 2.3 to 1.8 billion years ago that you could still have the red beds and banded iron formations at the same time, at least for a little while, well, 600 million years or so, until the planet was thoroughly oxygenated. Now, by that time, the biffs mostly disappear and red beds are ubiquitous and are still with us today. Okay, so now I'll do a little bit of review and then we're gonna look at biffs and red beds from a creationist perspective. Okay, now get ready. I'm going to give you a question first and then immediately provide the answer. So if you want some time to think about the question, make sure to put the video on pause. Okay, first question. Biffs are found in which two geologic eons? And the answer is the Archean and the Proterozoic. Now, if you said the Paleo-Proterozoic, you'd be correct, but the Paleo-Proterozoic is not an eon. It's an era, and the Proterozoic has three eras. Okay, biffs are made up of alternating bands of iron-rich and blank-rich minerals. Now, if you said silica, great job. Okay, conventionally, how did the iron and the silica get into the water column? Well, if you said through volcanic or hydrothermal activity, as well as from land erosion, you got it right again. All right, true or false? We find red beds in Paleozoic rocks. And the answer is true. All right, what is the conventional date for the Great Oxidation event? And the answer is 2.3 billion years ago. The presence of which diagnostic mineral supposedly tells us that the early atmosphere lacked oxygen? Now, if you said pyrite and you got the rest correct as well, then Give yourself a pat on the back. Okay, so what does all this mean from a creationist perspective? Well, given my own dynamic creationist model, I personally find no conflict between the scriptures and these findings. It may well be that God secondarily used stromatolites to oxygenate the atmosphere. This may mean that early in creation week, the Earth's atmosphere lacked oxygen and thus that allowed ferrous and other forms of free iron to saturate Earth's oceans. Now, for more information on this dynamic model, then check out the links in the description. Okay, now having said that, there are other creationist alternatives. Creationist Harry Dickens, he proposes that banded iron formations formed during pulses of intense magmatism. Now, Dickens notes that large igneous provinces or lips which are mostly composed of basalt, had volumes in excess of 
1,000 cubic kilometers and are often closely associated with the banded iron formations. Now, according to Dickens, Biff's formed when massive quantities of elements, including iron and silica, were pumped into the cold and fully oxygenated seawater, causing the iron and the silica to immediately precipitate out of the water column and be deposited on the ocean floor. Now, keep in mind that in the modern world, we've never experienced anything like the deposition of these massive igneous provinces. And so really have no idea what kinds of geologic structures such activity might produce. So as such, I think Dickens's model, it's worth thinking about. There are also anomalies with the conventional model that you'll typically not find in your historical geology textbook. For example, consider that the very presence of the hematite and the magnetite in banded iron is itself an indicator of an oxygenated atmosphere. Yet banded iron formations predate the great oxidation event by a billion years. We're told that this early Biff formation was possible because even though there was no oxygen in the atmosphere, there was a little bit of oxygen in the oceans that came from the growth of those Archean stromatolites. So it was only later, given the mass production of Paleoproterozoic oxygen from stromatolites, that led to the oxygenation of the atmosphere. I don't know, but is it possible that this account is nothing more than an ad hoc explanation constructed to help bolster the great oxidation event hypothesis? After all, iron was precipitating out of the Earth's oceans for a billion years before the supposed oxygenation of the atmosphere. Now, as it turns out, the presence of unstable minerals like pyrite which remember will always react with oxygen and thus decompose into stable iron oxides, they can be found in modern sedimentary environments. Now another diagnostic piece of evidence used to support the great oxidation event is the absence of red beds before 2.3 billion years ago, again using the conventional dating scheme. So remember that the red color comes from oxides such as hematite, that can only have precipitated out in the presence of oxygen. But red beds have been found in Archean rocks, which should cause us to question this, as well as some of the other diagnostic criteria. Now, commenting on these anomalies, this scientific review paper said, Superficially, these data, that's everything that I was talking about in the first half of the video, appear to provide compelling evidence for a reduced, that just means a non-oxygenated atmosphere. However, on close examination, each individual feature, we've talked about a few of those in the second half of the video, has been found to be ambiguous, incorrect, or compatible with alternative explanations. So what's the takeaway? Well, like I said, I'm totally fine with the current scientific consensus on the origin of banded iron formations, red beds, and the oxygenation of our early atmosphere. God could totally have done it that way. But we must always remember that scientific hypotheses are constantly in a state of flux. And that's why we should always take the historical sciences with a pinch of salt and remember that only the historical reliability of the scriptures can help us make sense, at least of the big picture. Okay, so that's all from me, Ken Colson here at Creation Unfolding. Look, if you were blessed from this video, if you received information that was helpful, then pound that like button and share this video on your social media platforms right now. Yes, please go ahead and do it. I'd really appreciate it. There's a link in the video if you'd like to give. I always appreciate that. And don't forget, spend just a few seconds even praying for creation unfolding ministries. Thank you and goodbye.